thank you, Paul, for joining me here today. And thank you, everyone, for coming to talk about how augmented reality is transforming industry. Uh, as many of you may know, Boeing's been a player in that space since the very beginning. So to kick us off, Paul, why don't you tell us about the beginnings of augmented reality at Boeing and, and kind of how it's grown from there? Yeah, I'd be happy to. Um, it's my pleasure to be here today. Uh, Boeing has been in augmented reality uh, since the late 1980s. I think it was 1989. Uh, two of our researchers at the time, uh, David Mizell and Tom Corvell, uh, had the idea if we could merge digital information with the real world, with what we're trying to do, there could be some benefits there. So they did a, um, an experiment, really. Um, it had a very elaborate head-mounted display, and a, it was on a wiring uh, board. And they really just saw some very basic 2D uh, lines that showed them how to route, uh, route these wire harnesses for, for commercial airplanes. Um, so we got our start quite a long time ago. Um, Boeing's been around for obviously a long time. Um, I think Dacry's been around for four or five years now. So I mean, how did you guys get into AR and, and tell us about your beginnings? Sure. Yeah, we, we got into it in about 2010. And originally the idea, uh, and still the idea today, was to empower as many people both to experience augmented reality as to create augmented reality. What we found very quickly was that it took the scale of the enterprise to do that. And so we started out on the software side of enterprise augmented reality. And then we were very hopeful that hardware was going to be created you know, within the industry that would enable those sorts of technologies and the types of use cases that we knew were possible. But unfortunately, kind of the first generation of consumer wearables really fell short of that by adopting a lot of consumer constraints and, and looking to be something of a cell phone replacement. And so it was at that point, uh, coming up on two years ago, uh, that we said it was really a smart helmet that would best sort of encompass the capability required and the horsepower required to pull off uh, industrial augmented reality at scale. And speaking of that, so uh, within Boeing today, where does augmented reality live? You know, what, what group and who's involved? Sure. Well, most of, what, most of our work, um, I'm focused on the manufacturing domain. So I'm, I'm all about how to better connect uh, people building airplanes to the digital data behind them. Um, m most of our AR work is in the pilot phase. It's still in the R&D organization. We work with our programs um, uh, to develop and implement what we're, what we're trying to do. Um, there's a lot of gaps in, in where we are and where we need to be. Um, there's, um, you know, we, 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 can all, we can create augmented reality uh, experiences very successfully in a lab. Uh, when we get into an enterprise, um, there are a lot of challenges there. Um, uh, talk, uh, talking about scalability and how we interface with other enterprise systems and, and things like that. So um, uh, when we talk about challenges, I mean, what do you see are some of the, some of the roadblocks um, uh, to, to what we are trying to accomplish with, with augmented reality? I think really they fall into three categories. I would say there are software challenges, uh, content challenges, and hardware challenges. And we've seen, you know, just tremendous technology development in each of those categories over the last couple of years. So all of the right pieces are starting to be out there. Uh, but really, the ecosystem sort of demands collaboration right now, where folks who are making, you know, really great embedded hardware, like Movidius, who we were on stage with here this morning, uh, folks who are creating software platforms or who are already kind of the storehouses of that content, can partner with hardware providers to, to bring those to bear on those use cases. And ultimately not to change business process, but to fall in line with what's already happening today so that you don't have to sort of reinvent or recreate new departments, new skill sets, new labor forces, uh, which would be tremendously time intensive and difficult. Yeah. So to that point, you know, how do you see uh, augmented reality scaling both within Boeing, but also within the industry at large? Well, um, one thing that we've uh, constantly come up against in terms of scaling, we have to convince uh, our program managers that augmented reality is going to be a benefit for them. Um, there's technical side of scaling, obviously, and cultural side, and, and, um, and also the business case. So uh, w one thing we did to approve out that business case, we really needed some numbers. Um, well, when we take augmented reality for one of our programs, the first thing they say is, what's the ROI? Uh, why would we invest in this technology? Why would we implement it? So um, last year, we did a study with Iowa State University and it was a controlled user study, and uh, we wanted to compare uh, different ways of bringing, uh, different modes of delivering work instruction. So we brought, um, th there was around 50 people in the study, and we made a mock um, a wing. Um, it was a, a about six feet long. It wasn't a real wing, it was a, a mock one. And uh, we s had three sets of work instructions. One was on a desktop computer that was in the corner of a room, and it had a PDF document on it, and that's actually most similar to what we do today in the factory. Mm -hmm. Uh, we also had the same PDF uh, instructions on a tablet computer. 
um, and so it was all 2D again, but they could use it at the point of use. And then the third uh, set of instructions was augmented reality. We had our, pilot, our prototype augmented reality system. Um, and what we found was, uh, so we ran about 50 people through the study and we had them build the wing and we would look at um, the quality of the build, um, how many mistakes did they made and wh whether they were major or minor mistakes and, and how long it took to took them to build the wing. Things like did they catch the mistakes or, or did the mistakes end up in, the, you know, in their finished wing. And the results were actually quite astounding. Um, uh, we found uh, between the desktop computer, which is our baseline to using augmented reality, uh, the number of errors went down by over 90%. And these were people that we just brought in off the street, um, mm -hmm. not even necessarily a technical background. Um, and we had them build this wing and for 90% fewer errors. And not only did they build it to higher quality, but they built it much faster. They mm -hmm. were on average 30% faster. And so um, when we take these numbers to program managers, of course, they're very interested. Um, and I always think even if we don't realize those numbers, even if we only see a fraction of that, uh, with the scale of what we're doing mm -hmm. and other industries, um, it, it, it's, it's, it's going to be huge. So you know, I think we've made the case, uh, at least in our industry, um, for what we're trying to do, and now, uh, now the next job is to implement it. So, but I mean, what, um, uh, what are some of the other industries that you're seeing use cases in for augmented reality? I mean, aerospace, I've talked a little bit about building things. I'm sure we're not the only large company who's, who's trying, to, trying, mm -hmm. to, trying to do this kind of work. So who else, are, who else are you seeing in this space? Certainly, I think aerospace has a number of characteristics that match a lot of the other industries that we've seen kind of be the early adopters in this space. So you look at uh, highly regulated, you know, that, that certainly has an oversight kind of uh, angle to it and a compliance requirement where the media capture alone of these augmented reality devices is a, a really powerful tool in that ecosystem. So you look at things like energy and oil and gas, you know, which share similar regulatory climates. And then anywhere where the cost of error is high, because if you look at what these augmented reality devices, what things like the smart helmet can do, uh, ultimately it's about taking the best of humans and the best of machines. And machines are really great at not making errors along a predefined process. And so we've found that in the energy sector, in heavy manufacturing, anywhere where that cost of a single error can be astronomical, especially if you have to go through a recall or you have to go through additional oversight as a result of that single error, those have really been kind of the, the first ones that are picking up. Uh, but we're quickly seeing that now kind of cascade into a number of other industries that have overlap in process, where the, the types of operations, say maintenance or assembly or any type of guided work instruction uh, is kind of key to their business. Uh, those have been some of the other places that have uh, picked up really quickly. You know, so uh, it's obviously not all sunshine and rainbows in getting augmented reality out there into industry. What are some of the challenges uh, that you guys have seen? Sure. Uh, well, I think um, you know my, my earlier comment, 1989 to 2015, shows it's not sunshine and rainbows. We still we're still not where we need to be. Mm -hmm. um, one of the big things um, is uh, understanding where things are in 3D space. Talking about technical challenges, um, uh, tracking, uh, mm -hmm. under, you know, understanding where um, a tablet is if you're using a tablet or a cell phone or, or a head-mounted display. I, like I mentioned, those things are easy in the lab, very difficult on the shop floor in production. Um, especially when you look at the scale of our factory. We want to get systems that can track throughout the factory is very difficult to do. Um, connection to enterprise systems, I mentioned that earlier. Uh, how do we get existing digital data into uh, an augmented reality system? You know, uh, we already have all these work instructions for all our airplanes. We don't, we don't want to have to rewrite those in mm -hmm. a special format for some augmented reality system. So um, getting um, our existing systems connected to new systems is, 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 is very challenging. And those are all what I kind of term as the less sexy problems in AR mm -hmm. that you know, may not be quite so exciting to look at, yeah. but they do need to be solved in mm -hmm. order for, 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 us, for us to use AR. So, um, and then, of course, there's, uh, on the non-technical side, there's cultural issues. Um, we, you know, we have um, folks who have been using paper instructions for, for you know, 100 years, and, 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 and now we're trying to present them with this new medium. Uh, you know, so it's really a paradigm shift in how we communicate technical data. Mm -hmm. and, um, you know, uh, we see it across the spectrum. Some folks um, uh, almost expect it, and, and some folks are a little bit hesitant. They're, they, you know, they kind of, you know, they they're don't want to challenge the status quo. So, yeah. in many cases, the less you can make it feel like technology, the better. You That's know, exactly. the more it's just a, a part of the way that work gets done, or it's just a, another tool in the tool belt. I think that that becomes a big enabler. Yep, making it as seamless as possible. Um, yeah, so it's, it's, it's yeah, it's very important. So. Mm -hmm.
So um, folks here might be interested, um, you know, uh, it's a very new space, uh, very geographically diverse, I think, lots of pockets around the world of development uh, yeah. happening. Um, California is certainly one of them. I think Germany is a hotbed of this type of technology. Mm -hmm. I mean, how would you suggest, I mean, with your, fairly, you know, DACO is a fairly young company, how would you suggest folks can get more connected in this field and, and, and uh, you know, learn more about it? Absolutely. I think global collaboration around augmented reality is really crucial. You know, we're starting to see, as far as the technical challenges go, in individual categories, those things are being kind of ticked off or solved uh, one by one. Um, but no one yet has kind of that comprehensive top to bottom all the way to the end user uh, sort of single offering. And the, the reason for that is you've got to go within industry to do that. You've got to have hardware, you've got to have software and that content, you know, which as you said, already sort of has a home and much like that geographically all of these different components you know live around there so I think there are a number of different kind of industry groups and events that people can look at and get involved with around augmented reality or even just bringing an augmented reality component to their existing industry events I think uh, there's a lot of opportunity still for people to be champions for augmented reality within their organization and to, to bring that in and sort of start to saturate the culture, uh, which I think is, is what's needed in order for people to be successful. Yeah, kind of a follow on also, I mean, uh, thinking about how people would get into this field, um, you know, I think it takes a, a, a lot of different disciplines to create an augmented reality experience. Mm -hmm. um, and I've seen that on my team. We have technical people, we have some artists. And, um, but, what, you know, um, if you were to put together a team of people needed to create an augmented reality experience, who would be on that team? Yeah, that's a great question. And I think, you know, you touched on one of the key points there, which is you've got science and art already. So you've got some development skill sets that are needed. You know, systems integration is a really huge part of that technical challenge. So people who have a working knowledge and a comfort with those existing systems and then user experience is a piece that I think is often new to a lot of these contexts because you've had work package authors sort of separated from the context of where that actual operation is being performed so the more you can have somebody that can kind of look across the entire user experience and find ways to make it more seamless and tie those parts together the the more successful the team will be and uh, the collaboration will be in the end user experience will be ultimately yeah well, uh, uh, we're very excited to get to, to, to get into this space more and more. I think, um, you know, when we look at what it can do for companies like us, um, I think we really only scratch the surface. Uh, I think um, providers like Daiquiri and others um, think have a lot of work to do to solve these challenges and, and, and deliver products. And we have a lot of work to do um, to get the technology fully integrated so we can realize what we're doing. And, you know, I, 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 like I said, I think we've only just scratched the surface. I think that we have a long road ahead of us. Definitely. If you had to sum up in just kind of one sentence what, what an ideal future would look like, what, what would that look like for Boeing? Um, well, in terms of, you know, the work instruction delivery and augmented reality, I think, um, you know, it would be a fully integrated, seamless digital thread. Mm -hmm. So um, products are, you know, designed in 3D. Um, the same 3D data is used in manufacturing. That same 3D data can be used in support. Um, and, and that, that so that the digital thread that's parallel to the real world would be totally integrated and seamless. Uh, we're not there yet. Um, it's, it's quite segregated, and we're we're trying to fill those pockets. But yeah, we would. Uh, that would be my vision. This this, this seamless digital thread. Fantastic. Yeah, and I think that, that dovetails really nicely with what we're looking to do, which is really to be able to empower any worker to perform any task in any place for any company on any project at any time. Mm -hmm. And uh, I think that's about the time we have for today. So thank you, Paul, My for pleasure. joining me, yeah. and, and thank you, everyone, for, for joining us and listening. Thank you.